Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about applying Surface PTV um, to some really, really shallow flows um, in uh, an experimental uh, Brady River channel um, that was actually conducted nine years ago, um, but the data have only just been processed in the past month or so. Okay, so because I'm conscious that this is quite a, a varied audience, I'll just briefly introduce braided rivers. Um, braided rivers flow in two or more anastomosing channels around alluvial islands, forming a pattern resembling the intertwining effect of a braid when viewed from above. And they are some of the most complex morphological features on Earth's surface, as shown here by a detrended DEM uh, from our experiments and also from a uh, DEM of difference also from our experiments. And there have been many experimental studies conducted on braiding over the past 70 years or so, some of which have been accidental, intending to, uh, to simulate uh, meandering rather than braiding, and some of which have been deliberate. Um, we planned to uh, conduct experiments aimed to looking at the uh, variability and the impact of um, sequences of flood events and um, the discretization of, um, of flood events um, by um, numerical models on the outcome of, of the braiding process. So our experimental setup, um, we conducted experiments in the 11 metre long, 6 metre wide total environment simulator at Hull. Um, we built three 1.7 metre wide parallel channels and we filled them with well-sorted sand with a D50 of 0.73 millimetres and installed a slope at 0.013. Each channel was fed by a calibrated sump pump and a sediment feeder. Um, and we dug an initial uh, 15 centimetre wide and two centimetre deep straight channel um, through all three uh, channels and then allowed the bed to evolve into a fully uh, braided configuration over a six hour period. At the end of that six hour period, we then fed um, each channel with constant water and sand input for a further 21 hours until we reached a steady state in terms of the balance between sediment input and sediment output. The flow regime we looked at was modeled based on observations of experiments that had been conducted in the same facility only weeks before that had observed that the threshold of sediment motion was about 0.86 liters per second plus um, information that we had about the mean annual floods of the Taliamento River, which was used to uh, scale down um, the, um, the experimental duration using fruit scaling, and also the Sun Wapta River, which when we looked at the scaling was roughly the same uh, scaled width as our experimental channel. And we uh, estimated the equilibrium sediment feed rate using the function that uh, Walter Bertoldi had developed based on his own um, experimental braided channels in 2009. And what we aimed to do was to discretize the natural flood event um, using a, a step function in our pumps. And what you should be able to see by eye is that the areas beneath uh, the curves but below the 0.86 uh, liters per second threshold are equal, even though the magnitude of the events uh, varied. The particular um, flow I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, channel two, which is the largest of the discretized events. Um, and on that channel, we collected six epochs of PTV imagery. Um, two of those epochs were just partial coverage, and I'll just mention that briefly in a second. And their duration varied from a little over two minutes to a little over uh, five minutes. At the same time, we also conducted structure from motion imagery um, and we collected that over 10 epochs. Um, and we also collected um, terrestrial laser scan um, DEMs at the beginning of our experiments and also at the end of our experiments. Camera, tracer, and PTV setup um, involved a Nikon D3100 DSLR fitted with a standard Nikkor 18 to 55 millimeter lens, collected video at 1080p at a shade under 24 hertz. 
Uh, this converted to an object space pixel size of 1.41 to 2.06 millimeters. We seeded the flow by hand using five millimeter white plastic hammer beads and we made no attempt to optimize the shutter speed. So in some of the videos, um, the, the beads actually appear lozenge shape because the shutter speed was too long. And all of the PTV processing was conducted in PTV lab. I note that Antoine has asked some questions earlier, um, but I did have to modify PTV lab so that it worked in uh, the most current version of MATLAB. Um, I also had to modify it so that I operated only on the blue channel rather than the mean of the red, green and blue channels. Furthermore, rather than uh, subtracting the average image from um, the, the frame sequence, um, I uh, extracted the minimum image. This was because some of the hammer beads got stuck. Um, and if I uh, subtracted the mean, then I actually got negative uh, intensity values, uh, which obviously um, would mean that I would miss my beads. So having subtracted my image away, um, I then um, detected particles using a standard Gaussian mask with a particle size of about four pixels, a uh, correlation threshold of 0.6 and an intensity threshold of 60 to 80. I could have used 60 across the board, um, but I chose to just optimize that slightly to remove a couple of false matches that I received on a, on a couple of uh, frames. And this then went through into a standard cross correlation algorithm um, with a window size of 16 pixels, um, minimum correlation of 0.6 and a neighbor similarity percentage of 33.33%. So that is that um, one vector out of every three needed to be similar to its neighbors in order for that vector to be accepted. And because seeding was um, uneven, uh, I decided that I would um, ensemble all of my vectors uh, into a single uh, velocity field for each uh, time period. And the results um, are, are pretty impressive. So from our videos, we got a total of uh, between 300 uh, and 32,000 and 918,000 post-process vectors initially started off with 420,000 to nearly one and a half million vectors. Uh, this is in an area of about four square meters, so that's uh, a vector every 4.4 millimeters. Um, I performed three levels of post-processing. The first was a spatial averaging filter. This is similar um, to the Vestaville and Scorano um, moving median. Uh, filter and also Tony Wells um, uh, filter the median uh, sorry the median absolute deviation from the median filter that he has in his win ADV software the only difference from the Vestavion Scorano filter was that rather than imposing a set percentage of 90 percent instead I use Chauvenet's criterion or I use the universal threshold criterion to uh, remove points I also uh, enforce directionality because all my flow should have been moving downstream. And I also provided a filter on the secondary flow angle. So any secondary flows, any, any cross stream flows that formed an angle greater than 75% from the downstream, 75 degrees, sorry, from the downstream direction, I filtered those out as well. So you can see the statistics on the, uh, the number of uh, vectors that were filtered out. But actually, when you look at the remaining vectors at the end of it all, it, it actually didn't have a, a significant impact on what we got. So here are some example flow fields. Um, all of the um, flow fields I'm going to show in the next couple of slides are scaled uh, according to the uh, velocity magnitude contour the color that I've got. Um, so the maximum velocity was about 0.58 meters per second. Um, I've got two cases here, um, a low flow case to the bottom left and a high flow case to the bottom right. And I think you can see that this is really data rich in terms of uh, what we can see. If I just zoom in a little bit on that top right uh, image, you can start to see some uh, really interesting flow features. So you can see flow divergence uh, around the bar heads. You can see convergent zones and some shear zones at the bar tails. You can start to see uh, flow retardation here along a uh, cross stream, cross channel bar. 
and there's you know a wealth of, of, of information uh, to be seen here. So I've done this for our six epochs. Um, we had two camera positions, um, one looking at the, the upstream part of the flume, the other looking at the downstream part of the flume. Uh, one of my um, colleagues got a little bit lost on these uh, latter couple of, uh, of images over here to the right. So he went further uh, upstream from the downstream flows that he really needed to. And then what I wanted to, to show rather than dwelling on, on these beautiful images was to actually look at some, um, some, some spatial averaging. So if we think about um, our ensembles and we consider this as an ensemble average flow, then when we then look at our spatial averaging, um, this can perhaps tell us something about um, the behavior of the flows uh, in particular regions of the flume. And of course, this is very sensitive to the spatial averaging window. So I just wanted to show that sensitivity here. Um, and as you increase the radius of the spatial averaging window, so small scale features get smeared out, but um, at the same time, uh, our relative error um, initially reduces uh, before uh, increasing again once we get to a radius of about uh, 32 pixels. So what this shows is that areas where there are very few vectors um, and areas where uh, the um, mean is close to zero, these are showing up as our areas with the uh, greatest uh, relative error. Um, as you would expect. And I will say that the cross stream uh, vector components uh, have a larger uh, mean relative error uh, within each spatial averaging window of the region of uh, 20 to 60 percent, actually. Um, but I, I didn't have the time to present that today. So I conclude by employing uh, time space substitution and ensembling um, all of um, our PTV traces. We obtain high, high resolution up to 1 million 2D vectors in a four uh, square meter area with a resolution of about one vector per four uh, meter squared. Results can almost certainly be improved with more even seeding, uh, thinner seeding because the, the hammer beads actually got stuck in flows less than about five millimeters uh, deep uh, and also optimizing the camera shutter speed. But what I wanted to talk about really was that there is huge scope here to reanalyze experimental videos from the past 70 years and to turn qualitative observations into quantitative measurements. And taking that just a step further, uh, I just wanted to put this out there as to whether by looking at spatial averages, can we think of those deviations from the ensemble mean within a, a space time window? Can we take them as being indicative turbulence? So here's an example looking at the UV uh, deviation from the mean within each spatial window. And we can see that the, the bluer areas here are, are slower flows that have been deflected towards the right bank. The red areas are uh, faster flows deflected towards the left bank. And obviously there is sensitivity here to our averaging window, but I just thought I'd put it out there that maybe this is a, another way to look at turbulence and to extract, extract some turbulence information where we maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to do so. So I have some remaining challenges. I've had issues with perspective distortion in trying to get my velocity fields overlaying with the DEM. Uh, and also have issues with SFM in that we didn't initially optimize our overlaps nor the angles from which we took the photographs. So there is doming when we employ a traditional SFM pipe flow. And I'm currently testing the MICMAC software to try to improve ground control points in the vector system. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Rob. Uh, very fascinating images, and uh, I love the Tagliamento River. So, beautiful. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Rob? Rob, beautiful work. Um, just sort of a, a maybe question and comment. You had what looked like rather sparse PIV seed in the end that you talked about in terms of particle tracking, but you ended up using a PIV analysis, if I'm following you correctly. Is there a reason you didn't just go with particle tracking, given the oh, I did might be more PT accurate? I did use PTV. Um, did so, yeah. So it's it's a PTV algorithm that uses cross correlation uh, between individual particle locations. 
Got you. So it's a sort of predictor of the position and then tracks it. Great. Yeah. Nice yeah. work. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the 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 thing you mentioned earlier about the spatial averaging we do you did with the with the velocity fields you measured. Uh, I was wondering if it, if that is related with uh, the fact that in PTV we have uh, a random dispersion of particles, so we we always have a stochastic distribution of velocity, and if that helps you to have. Um, let's say a structured grid where you have your data. And uh, if, you, uh, if you considered other, uh, what method did you consider to structure your grid basically? Okay, so, um, so the PTV is, is gridless, um, but the averaging I then converted um, onto a gridded uh, system. It's just a uniform grid um, spaced over my, my image just for visualization. Um, so it runs from um, the smallest uh, PTV uh, vector location to the largest PTV vector location in a step of one. Um, uh, in, in terms of um, the, 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 the cross correlation, spatial correlation, um, yeah, there's, there's going to be some sensitivity in the outputs um, to both the scale of the channel uh, and the, the velocities themselves. And that's something in terms of the errors that I showed, that's something that I'm still running through my head in terms of how I need to account for um, any autocorrelation that might appear, occur within each spatial window. Um, but I, I wanted to show that today because uh, I, I just thought it might be, might, might bring some, some discussion amongst the group. Yes, because I, I worked with PTV some years ago and still work in my free time sometimes. And one of the questions we I constantly face is when I need to pass from a gridless method to a grid method so I can compare with the other with other measurements, with the numerical simulations, etc. And one of the, the questions that constantly arises is what should be the size of this uh, structured grid that I define? and normally should be based on particle concentration, but particle concentration, it's not always uniform. So yes, that's the opposite, yes. There is a, uh, still a, an ongoing discussion and I, it's, it's good to have this opportunity to see that I'm not the only one having the, facing the same, uh, the same doubts and same questions. <laughs> yeah, and there's definitely, as I say, there's definite sensitivity to that and it'll be a function of your particular flow field. Yeah, thank you.